everyone. My name is Madam Pamita and my business is the Parlor of Wonders, which you can find online at parlorofwonders.com. I'm located in Los Angeles, California, and we don't have a physical shop. We have a mail order business, so we don't have any place that you can visit us, but we are located in Los Angeles. Um, if you want to find us online, um, of course, parlorofwonders.com. If you want to reach out to us, you can reach us reach out to us at info at parlorofwonders.com. We also have a text line that you can reach out and text me. And I'm the one that sees the text messages. And that number is 310-510-6184. On Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all the places you can find me as Madam Pamita. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and then we're going to learn about how to plan a candle spell. So my passion is candle magic. I have been doing candle magic since I was a very little girl. I used to, was raised Catholic and I used to say my first candle spells were the ones when I was going into church and making a wish and lighting a candle there at church. I think all of us are candle magicians. We all have made a wish and blown out candles for a birthday or, um, you know, lit a candle with an intention. And that's really what candle magic is at its very basic level is, is thinking of a wish or an intention and then lighting a candle for that wish. But you can get much, much more complex with that. And I think sometimes people get overwhelmed with that. So, um, you know, if you look at the books that are out there on candle magic, the vast majority of them are recipe books. They are great recipe books, but they just say, hey, light a green candle on a Friday and burn it for seven days. And this is your prosperity spell. But they don't explain to you why you're burning that green candle, why you're lighting it on a Friday, why you're burning it for seven days. So I made, um, I wrote the book of candle magic, which is published by Llewellyn. And it just came out this past October. And I wrote that to address this issue of being able to create your own candle spells from scratch and having the knowledge and understanding why those recipes that you see in those fabulous other books are created the way they're created. And so this book is a way to take you from the very, very beginner level of candle magic all the way up to very, very advanced layouts and multi-day spells and working with numerology and astrology and a lot of other things as well. So um, if you're interested in doing candle magic and going either from the very basics to very advanced, you will want to check out this book. But what I'm going to be teaching you today is about how to um, do some candle magic from scratch, how to do a candle spell from scratch, and what are the things that you may want to think about as you are doing that. So um, what we're going to talk about is first, when you're going to do a candle spell, it's good to sit down and make a plan about what you want to do. So for your first question that you want to ask yourself before you do some candle magic is what is the objective of my spell? Get very clear about the objective of your spell. That means that you should not have 15 different things in your mind when you're doing a spell. Yes, you could do a spell for 15 different things, 15 different blessings, I suppose, but having a focus to your spell is going to be helpful. So if your spell is, for example, uh, you know, for love, what is it? Do you want a new romance? Are you wanting to fix the romance and the relationship that you're in right now? What is it? What is your objective? So when you already have that objective in mind, let's say, for example, you want to do a spell to increase prosperity. You have that spell in mind. I want to increase my financial flow. Now that in itself is a good objective, or you might say, I want to get a raise at work, or you might say, I want to win the lottery or whatever it is that your idea of that um, uh, prosperity and attracting that prosperity, what that would look like, that's going to help guide you into the other elements that you're going to bring into that spell. So once you decide what your objective is, and let's, for example, say, um, let's use the, I want a raise at work let's use that as our example. So when we want to do, we can decide at that point, do we want to do a simple spell where you can just light the candle and go, or do you want to spend some time and energy crafting, customizing, and getting some details in there? There's no right or wrong answer to that question. It's what works for you. So there's no point in planning a big elaborate you know, spell if you don't have the time and energy because it's just going to stay a plan. So you get to decide for yourself first, do I want to do it easy, just grab it and go, 
or do I want to do something that I create and craft and, and make more detailed and elaborate? So easy candles would be something like a vigil candle that's already prepared by a, a spiritual worker who's going to put herbs in it or put something in it, or even um, beautiful companies like Coventry Creations create candles that have herbs in them and that have an intention. And so you can take one of those candles and just light it and go and your, your spell is good to go. So vigil candle, we prepare vigil candles at my shop. A lot of places prepare vigil candles or you can get one that's already prepared with herbs and everything in it already. All right, that's the easy one that you can do. Or you can choose that more complex one. Maybe you wanna get a figural candle or something that represents that rays to you, or you wanna pick the colors of those candles and so on. Now at my shop, we make um, beeswax candles. We make them in beautiful shapes that are supporting different magical outcomes. So that would be an example of a more complex spell because it doesn't have any herbs in it, doesn't have any oils on it. You're gonna to have to put those things on it, all right? So there's, there's the two examples that I'm giving there. Now, another consideration before you get started with your spell is how much do you wanna spend on your spell? Do you have a budget that you have to, you know, really think about? And so if that's the case, you know, then you go to the dollar store and find a vigil candle or you um, can, you know, use even a birthday candle or, um, you know, just a, a simple taper. That's not going to be expensive, right? Or do you have money that you can spend on making your spell really beautiful and having those elements that you want to have in it have some unusual magical herbs for example or add some glitter or um, add you know some glass glitter or something like that you know you can think about these things and where do I want to go with it do I want to go just quick dirty and cheap or do I want to get into something much more elaborate that's another thing to consider when you're planning your spell Third thing, fourth thing, I don't even know what number we're at right now, fourth thing. Um, when we're choosing our candles for our spell work, do I wanna choose a specific color candle for the spell? So for example, if you're doing that spell for your rays, you could choose a green candle, you could choose a gold candle, you could choose a yellow candle, which also represents gold. Those are all good things that are gonna support that money outcome, getting that raise at work, right? So when you're thinking about that, do you have the option of having a candle in that color? And if you do, then you can choose a color that also supports your objective magically with that color magic. So I have a whole section about color magic in my book. So if you are not sure what color goes with your spell, you can take a look at my book and you'll find out just exactly what I'm talking about. Um, Another question to consider when you're planning your spell, do you want a candle that's already infused with oils and herbs, or do you want a plain candle that you have to put the oils and herbs on yourself? Again, that's kind of going back to that question, do I want something that's really ready to go, or do I want something that I get to customize in my way? So green candle, plain green candle, you could add oils for steady work, steady work oil, or um, magnetic attraction to attract that boss, you know, to giving you the raise, or you could put like abundant prosperity oil to draw that money. So you can choose which one you want when you add it yourself and you can choose what nuanced direction you want to take it. You can also buy a candle that's already prepared. It's got the oil in it and then you don't have to buy the oil or even worry about the herbs or anything like that. Um, do you want to have a candle that is symbolically shaped, shaped like something that also will add an element to your magic? Or do you want to buy one that's just plain? You know, there's reasons for doing that. If you have a candle that's shaped like a skull or a candle that's shaped like um, a, a human body, people are gonna look at that and they're gonna go, is she doing magic over there? That looks like magic to me. Now that may not be a concern for you, but if it is a concern, maybe you have to keep your magic kind of on the down low. You know, a plain candle that doesn't look like anything, nobody's going to suspect that it's a spell. But if you can, you know, get elaborate and you can get these symbol symbolic shapes into your spell work, then you can definitely add that element of support for your spell work. And it also is like fun to burn something that looks magical. You know, I live in a house where magic has always been around since day one. And so nobody questions it when they see a skull candle on my, you know, on my altar. So it depends on your situation, where you live and how secret you have to be. And also like, do you want that? Is that your jam or is it not? Now, um, do you want a, another consideration when you're picking out candles and you're trying to plan your candle spell 
is do you want a candle that's fragranced with a fragrance or do you want one that's fragrance free? So for example, you go to the store and you get a Yankee candle that's gonna have a fragrance in it. The fragrance doesn't really have an, anything to support unless it's done with essential oils. My opinion is fragrance is nice. Fragrance is lovely and it creates a mood. It can definitely create a mood, but it may not energetically support anything one way or the other. It's just sort of a, a neutral substrate, right? It doesn't harm your spell. It doesn't hurt your spell. And maybe it sets a nice mood. Maybe maybe the smell of, for example, bayberry, which is a an herb, an actual herb that um, supports money and, and attraction of money and abundance and prosperity and so on. Maybe that scent of bayberry, even if it's not real bayberry, Bayberry, maybe it's a scent of bayberry. You can get those bayberry candles at um, Christmas time, right? So maybe that scent to you smells like money. So even if it's a fragrance, if it smells like abundance to you, then it's good, right? It works. So do you want a candle that has a fragrance or do you want one that's fragrance free? Now, fragrance free, if you have allergies or if you're sensitive to fragrance, then you'll probably want fragrance free. If you like a fragrance, then you go for a fragrance. So it's, it's a choice that you can make based on maybe your health. You know, if you feel you get headaches or something from fragrance or people around you don't like it, then you might want to avoid it. All right. So um, let's see. Do you want a, another question you might ask yourself when planning your candle spell is, do you want a candle that comes in a glass container? You know, the vigil candles that come in a glass container, or do you want one that's a freestanding candle? that either you put it in a candle holder, like a taper, you can put it in a candle holder or you affix it to a tray or you have it in some kind of holder of some kind. Now there's no right or wrong answer for that. It's just a preference. You know, even this candle, this taper candle, you could put it in a glass jar and have it have a glass jar holding it if you'd like it. There's nothing to say that there's anything, you know, right or wrong about that. But some people like to have a glass container candle, other people don't. There's, there's different things that you can do with those. With a glass container candle, you can stick a sticker on that glass container, the vigil candle or the glass jar. Um, you could also use a paint pen and you could write on that glass jar. Um, but what you won't be able to do is, unless it's a pullout, which is the candle comes out of the glass jar, if that candle is, is embedded in the glass jar, you won't be able to inscribe on the sides. You won't be able to put oil on the sides of the candle. That's because that candle is in that glass jar and you won't be able to take it out of the glass jar. However, as I mentioned, there are candles that you can pull out that you could inscribe on it, um, really carving them and inscribing them and doing, making beautiful, beautiful candles with these pullout candles, right? So you can have a pullout candle that you put back in the glass jar and it can have those things on the side, but the vast majority, you can't do that. Now with a freestanding candle, you have access to all the surfaces, right? So you can inscribe on it, you can put oils on it, you can put herbs on it, you can put glitter on it. You can do a lot of things with a freestanding candle. So it just sort of depends what your preference is, what your plan is. It's just something to consider as you're choosing your candles for your candle spell. Now, what else do you um, consider? Well, do you? here's another thing that you may not have thought of. Do you want to buy a candle that's already been made or do you wanna make your own candle? Because you can make your own candle. There's lots of tutorials online that show you how to dip a candle, how to make a candle. So there's, um, you know, you can get some wick, you can get a kit at like a uh, craft store like Michael's and make a candle that way. Um, there's lots of ways that you can make a candle, lots of candle supply companies online. So you can make your own candle as well. If you're buying a candle that's already been made by someone else, then you consider where you're shopping from. Are you buying your candle from a factory that just pumps out candles and they don't really care one way or the other about them? You know, they just want to sell a candle. Or are you buying a candle from uh, a, you know, someone who's a spiritual worker who puts energy into that candle for you to have that success? Who knows that you're going to use that candle for spell work? And I think that's something that has great value. If you have somebody that puts intention into what they're doing, and then they create that beautiful candle and then you're gonna put your energy on top of it. You really are starting with something that I think has a lot more juice than just something made by um, people paid not very much money and um, made by people who, who aren't magical workers and are working in a factory. 
That's my opinion about that. So I'm sure at the at the market today, at the um, full moon market, you're going to see a lot of people with beautiful candles who are making these candles and they put their heart and soul into them and they put their energy into them and they put all that love into them. So when you do your spell on top of that, you're going to have something that really is magnificent. Another last thing that you might want to ask yourself is, um, do I want to get a spell kit, right? Something that's already put together for me with candles and directions and tells me what to do, or do I want to sort of go on my own or create my own? So you can gather your materials yourself, or you can get a spell kit or something like that, that has, um, you know, oils or herbs or something along with a candle. So, and it tells you what to do. The simplest spell kit, believe it or not, is a vigil candle with a pre-printed label on it, either silk screened onto the glass or um, a sticker on the glass. A lot of those old school, I mean, I'm thinking about like the 70s, 80s and so on, back when I was a young, a youngin, um, we would see these candles in, you know, the vigil candles would have on the back a prayer or an intention or a spell that you could do. And they would give you a serving suggestion. So the vigil candles that I sell, same thing we give you a serving suggestion on how you can work with it. When should you light it? Um, how, you know, how many days should you light it and what's, what you should put on it and so on. Um, a lot of, of those printed vigil candles will do that and they'll give you something that you can say, it's a serving suggestion. You don't have to follow it, but it helps you along the way. My, at my shop, we also sell spell kits that teach you how to do spell work. I also do um, some spell, new moon spell, workshops as well. Every new moon, we do a workshop and I have a kit that goes along with that. So I hope this was helpful in thinking and getting into the mindset of what you're doing before you get the candle. Like if I want to do a spell, a candle spell for something, how do I get pick the right candle? How do I um, choose a candle for a spell when I don't know what I'm doing? So this is a great place to start is to start thinking about these questions and making some choices. On all of these questions, there's no right or wrong answer. It's just your preference or what works for you or what's gonna work best to serve your spell. So I hope that was helpful. And I wanna thank you guys so much for supporting the full moon market. And um, so excited to be sharing this information with you. Don't forget, you can find me online at parlorofwonders.com. Also wanna remind you guys, I forgot to say it earlier that I have some amazing workshops coming up. I also offer a free live Q and A every Sunday, except for the first Sunday of the month. Um, so if you wanna join me for that, you can just go to spellsquad.com and sign up and you will get the information on how to join the live Q and A. You also get a 33 page booklet from me. It's not a booklet, it's an ebook, sorry, 33 page ebook. Um, entitled Seven Secrets to Supercharge Your Spell Work. And that is a fabulous, fabulous tool for helping you with your magic. And it's free. It doesn't cost anything. You just get it for signing up on my email list. Um, got tons of workshops coming up too. So if you want to find out about my workshops, just go to witchcraftworkshops.com and I'll take you over to my site, over to the workshops page. Thanks again, you guys, for having me. And I hope you make some amazing magic with your candles. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Hello, welcome to the Buckland Museum of Witchcraft and Magic in Cleveland, Ohio. I am, well, at least the parking lot of it. We are here, well, I am. Um, here's my hearse. I call it Big Blue because of our founder, Raymond Buckland's book, Big Blue. And of course, I have a vanity plate there. But anyway, I just kind of wanted to start off how my guests, when they show up here, how they start off, um, show up in the parking lot, right? So my name's Stephen Intermill. I am the director of the museum. Why am I here? Well, about five years ago, I got this weird idea in my head. I remembered Raymond Buckland's book, um, The Complete Book of Witchcraft. I was working for a museum here in the Cleveland area, Pop Culture Museum. I was um, working in the department, uh, marketing department, I was also the curator of the museum there. I was, uh, if you've ever seen a movie uh, about the, uh, well, I guess I could say, I was uh, working for a Christmas story house. And what we were dedicated to is the film, A Christmas Story. Anyway, one day I was just bored out of my mind. Sorry, Brian, if you watch this, but I was like, 
during my lunch hour, I'm going to email Raymond Buckland, see whatever happened to his collection. Well, here we are. So, you know, it's everybody watching this. I mean, it all starts with a weird idea. Send that email. You never know what's going to happen. This definitely has changed my life. Ah, so we start over here, and then I thought we'd go in. So anyway, um, about five years ago, I emailed Ray. Then I got a phone call shortly after from a woman named Tony Rotunda. Now she's one of my dear friends, and she's also my partner in the museum. Tony is super incredible, and she was also the last acting high priestess in Ray's Last Coven. And she had acquired all these beautiful, magical pieces. Ray had given them to her. Uh, she was the one that cared enough to go down to New Orleans and pick them up from a uh, witch named Velvet Wreath. Velvet had kind of saved the collection in a situation. Um, don't really like getting into it so much, but Velvet, she had the collection. Ray picked it up, or uh, Tony picked it up for from her for uh, Ray. She brought it home and Ray was like, well, hey, you're interested. You should, uh, you should own the collection. So, now we are partners. Like, and this is what people come upon when they show up. My sign for the Witch Museum. Crystals, tarot, fun, occult books. And here's what the museum looks like from the outside. Uh, try to make it like fun, noticeable. Kind of Halloween-y, but you know. What do you expect, right? Um, yeah. One thing is, we, uh, we really, 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 really try to keep our social distancing in check. The last thing I want is an outbreak at the Witchcraft Museum. So buy your tickets online at bucklandmuseum.org before you come visit. Wear a mask. I really don't care all your reasons for not wanting to wear a mask. Just wear one. And uh, limit six guests. Come on in. So, you know how they say exit through the gift shop? Well, my museum, I'm lucky enough where you can enter through the gift shop as well. And here it is. We carry a lot of um, used books as well as new also antiquarian rare extraordinarily fascinating pieces here so uh, yeah if you see any on here that you're interested in give me a call or uh, email me bucklandmuseum at gmail.com but uh, yeah so here we have some crystals etc so we first started off in my friend's record shop. Now this was uh, coming up this Beltane that was four years ago. And uh, when we first opened, we had about 300 guests. People had come from states away to uh, meet Ray. It was kind of known that he was getting towards the end. Who's Ray? Well, you probably know this guy, Buckland's Complete Book of Wishcraft. I mean, it's now on its 55th printing, so you've been, I mean, yeah, yeah I, this is the primer for a lot of people that are first getting into this sort of stuff. So, let's see. We opened in 2017. We were my friend's record shop. And honestly, it was probably about a room about half the size of this space here. I wasn't really sure anybody would show up. I was trying to work on a catalog. Well, people kept knocking. And uh, still haven't finished the catalog yet. But... Uh, uh, we pivoted, as they say, we doubled in size pretty quickly. Then a uh, person bought the record shop's building, kicked out the record shop, told us we could stay. And I was like, ah, you know, kind of doesn't really work that way. So we found this location and we're coming up to our two year anniversary here. And if you see the beautiful tin ceilings, well, that's because, uh, we had a drop ceiling that I tore out. Yeah, lucky, lucky enough, I guess I had some N95 masks because of that a year ago. So uh, first year we had 5,600 guests. I guess last year we had about 3,500. So I mean, not bad during a pandemic, I have to say. So anyway, we enter here with the god as well as the goddess. They greet you on the way in. 
and we go through here. All right, so this is the Buckland Museum collection. A lot of people know the ritual robe here from the photo inside of Big Blue, the complete book of witchcraft. And uh, yeah, Ray had come to the United States in the early 60s. He had settled in Long Island and he started working as a copywriter. So he's making money, he's doing it as a writer. But, you know, he finds it spiritually lacking. He seeks and he discovers the work of Gerald Gardner in the Wicca. In 1951, it's my understanding that on the day they decriminalized witchcraft in the UK, Gardner sent out a press release. I think that's kind of funny. I like to think that he'd have a YouTube channel now, right? Or maybe a podcast. Heck, maybe even a TikTok. Wiccans love to dance, right? He and Ray started a friendship, and Gardner said, Well, if uh, you want an initiation, get one. Ray did. He took on the witch name of Robat. He came back to the States, and he formed what's known as the Long Island Coven, as well as uh, his own tradition of witchcraft, the Siax Wicca tradition. Um... He had founded his museum. One thing about Ray is he loved Gardner so much that, well, Gardner was a writer on witchcraft. Ray wanted to write about witchcraft. Gardner had a witchcraft museum. Ray wanted a witchcraft museum. And Ray just started a small collection, had it on display in his basement, just a few shelves. He got outed by the local media, and, uh, well, someone set his car on fire. Ray expands the collection, moves it out of the house, because he's a badass. And... Uh, <laughs> I always think about that. He told me that story at our opening, and I was like, okay, well, glad you told me about this before I got completely wrapped up with it. But yeah, um, Ray had his museum for years. It went into storage, and now it's here. So kind of a long, long, excellent adventure. So we have different sections here. We start off with Ancient Origins. We have some Egyptian pieces here. We have pieces that go back to Gerald Gardner in the Isle of Man. Over here, we have things from the original Long Island Coven. And, uh, I mean, it just blows my mind. This is like the beginning of, you know, modern, uh, like, alternative religion, I guess, in a lot of ways here in the States. We have some things about Ray's writing selection. Uh, uh, writings, uh, successes. Tools of witchcraft, artifacts that belong to elders in the craft. Some fur from Lil Bub. Why do we have fur from Lil Bub? Well, she was really the first great piece of publicity that we had when we first opened. Up here we have a staff that belonged to Oberon Zell, a very famous neo-pagan elder. He was here a couple years ago. The whole time he was here, I felt like I was under inspection. Last time he saw his collection was 1970. Well, I guess I passed the test. His apprentice wizard rolled in a few months later carrying the staff. Now this piece right here. This is a recently acquired H.R. Giger, Swiss occult artist extraordinaire. I, that came up for sale. I knew we had to have it. Um, Really delightful piece. It showed up right after we closed for the virus, and uh, I kind of needed some guardian angel energy at that point. Here we have an herbalism section. I call this back wall here the 6660s. A lot of really fun pieces here. Over here, I have an altar that belonged to um, someone that really has influenced me gentleman named H.R. Giger. Or, oh my gosh. Well, this is all one take, so... Rewind just a bit. Just a bit. Um, Dr. Leo Louis Martello. Uh, his book, Witchcraft, the Old Religion, really influenced me when I first read it 30 years ago. So, huge influence on me. Really, really proud that we have a beautiful Martello piece here for the collection. Jenny Hanover, our devil fish. Why do we have this? Well, you're going to have to come visit the museum and I'll tell you all about it. Maybe we should stare into the black mirrors here, see our future pasts. Whoa! That's the one that gets uh, 
kind of a weird thing happens. People stare into it and they see interpersonal dramas. Over here we have some Fent utensils from Lilydale. Have you ever been to Lilydale before? No? Well, if you haven't, you should. All right, here's behind the curtain. I am currently working on a project where we are uh, converting this into more gallery space. So, a little sneak preview there. Here is an altar in bulk. Talisman's Charms jewelry. Here we have a dress that was donated by writer Lilith Dorsey. The uh, New Orleans voodoo priestess. That's great. Thank you, Lilith, if you watch this. Tarot. Pieces, uh, props from the film The Love Witch. Donated by Anna Biller last year. And what we're going to end on here is a show in our rotating exhibit space. Steven Romano, New York City art dealer, loaned us a show. It's called Apparitions, Specters, Conjures, and the Paranormal. It closes on Sunday, so I think by the time you see this, well, it's going to be too late. But look at this thing. It's amazing. We have things on display from the 1600s to 2020. So really a broad spectrum which just crossed the veil. Some really cool pieces. Um, William Mortensen makes an appearance. Here we have Darcilio Lima. Brazilian occult artist extraordinaire. Wolfgang Grass. His story is pretty wild. He was, uh, he was just a kid when the city of Dresden was firebombed in World War II. And uh, it just all kind of goes from there. Really incredible artist. It's kind of my favorite part of this show. It's the vernacular photos. Just photos of everyday life where there, is there something going on? Ghosts? Kind of the original orb photos. And Stephen has so generously donated this piece here to the permanent collection. We trace this back to the Isle of Man and Gerald Gardner. So, I guess last but not least is our Magic Circle painted by Jesse Bransford. Um, probably know him from the Occult Humanities Conference in New York City, which uh, he co-hosts with uh, Pamela uh, Pam Grossman, and uh, yeah, the Magic Circle there. It's fun because a lot of people come in here and you can tell that they're pretty skittish about being here. Oh my gosh. Um, I did tell my mom she's going to freak out. And I would be like, well, let's go stand in the circle. It's the safest place. And then they see it and they're like, oh, I'm not getting anywhere near there. And I'm like, well, just can't really help you then. So yeah, visit our website, bucklandmuseum.org. Come see us sometime. Um, like I said before, we keep really strict social distancing. So... You know, I'm not like, uh, yeah, I feel pretty safe here. Um, we limit the amount of guests, only uh, six guests at a time, and uh, ticket appointment only. So, hope you all are doing all right. I hope you come visit me sometime. And, uh, you know, I think most importantly, the best thing I can tell you right now is stay witchy, my friends. All right, take care. See you here sometime. How's it going? This is Kiki with Which Way Magazine. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. I am here with you this evening. Just checking myself and my reflection. No, I'm here with you this evening because uh, I'm actually going to be talking about Ostara eggs. Um, I'm going to be showing you how to dye eggs with uh, natural products. And we'll also be doing some egg divination today as well. Um, I have got a total spread here in my kitchen, so I'm going to flip the phone so you could check. So we're going to be making some egg dye together. We're going to do some divination. And I've already got some eggs being dyed, so you could see what they look like in the process. 
So again, thank you for tuning in. If you are watching, make sure to leave a comment and say hello. Again, I'm Kiki with Which Way Magazine, and Which Way Magazine is an incredible, incredible resource. It is a, a wonderful digital magazine, and you can actually subscribe to it. And when you subscribe to Which Way Magazine, you get all sorts of awesome perks. That includes um, being able to watch all the previous videos that are in the Which Way Vault. And um, you also have access to special documents. These, these are like really cool things like Book of Shadow pages, journal pages, um, little extras and perks. So go to whichwaymagazine.com to check out all the different digital issues that are available as well as the subscription. So today I decided to cover the eggs because well, it's almost the spring equinox, and eggs tend to be a <laughs> the central point of the spring equinox celebrations. Um, it's also known as Ostara. Ostara tends to be the name of the holiday for Wiccans. Um, so that tends to be the common name. That's the one I use. Um, sometimes I just call it the good old spring equinox. Um, it's a great day to celebrate the return of spring. It's a holiday all about um, fertility. It's a holiday about abundance and about growing your garden. So anyways, because the egg is a central theme to the holiday, we are going to today learn how to dye eggs with natural things. So um, I will be flipping the phone a little bit just so you could see what I'm doing, but dyeing eggs naturally is actually very, very, very easy. So all you need to do to dye eggs naturally is get different products that create different colors, um, stick them in boiling water for a while, and then um, take the, separate the, the stuff from the liquid, and then you add vinegar to it. So just a little bit more details. What I did was I added different items to uh, one cup of the product to two cups of water. So you're probably wondering what those products are. There's all different things that you can use to create different color dyes. So um, for example, um, blueberries create a blue dye. And I do have an example of that going right now. Beets create a pink or red dye. That's another one I have on hand. Turmeric root creates a bright yellow egg and um, I did have some turmeric root. I mixed that in with onion peels because onion peels from a yellow onion create an orange dye. Uh, some other things too, red cabbage creates a blue or turquoise dye. Um, so I realized I didn't have anything green. Um, it turns out that you can use spinach to create a, a green dye. So that's where we're going to hang out today. I am boiling two cups of water, and I'm going to add about a cup of spinach. So, um... <laughs> All right. So here, this is... This is really fun to do, by the way, with one hand. So all I'm going to do is, I'm going to let the spinach... I actually have... I'm just going to... I have, like this much. I don't even know if that's a cup or not, but that's how much I have on hand. So what we're going to do now is I added about a cup of spinach to boiling water. We're going to let this boil for about 20 minutes. So probably by the time I'm just about wrapping up with this, we're going to go ahead and take it off the heat and strain it so we could see if it really died or not. Um, I've never worked with spinach before, but the other ones are coming along really, really well. I'm going to pass, go over here. This is the turmeric. And this has been sitting in the uh, turmeric dye for hmm, about 20 minutes. So what they say to do is, is the longer you leave the egg in the dye, the brighter it gets. So that's one of them. Wow, this one's awesome. This is the blueberry. These came out gorgeous. 
So that's blueberry. And then we've got beet over here. Beet, like Dwight Schrute. So here's a nice pink egg. So I'm just going to let those sit in here for a little longer and see what happens. Uh, and then hopefully we could get some green eggs in on the mix as well. So, yes, I see that there are some people watching. Be sure to leave a comment and say hello. And if you have any questions or if you have any experience dyeing eggs with homemade products, please leave a message. Um, you'll also find that the information that I'm sharing with you in this DIY clip is also in the March issue of Which Way Magazine, which you could go to whichwaymagazine.com to pick up an order for yourself. So while the spinach is cooking and while the eggs are dying, I thought I would share with you just a little bit about why the egg is such a significant symbol. So um, eggs are symbols of rebirth. They're symbols of birth, they're symbols of the soul, they're symbols of life, abundance, and fertility. There's even the notion of the universe being a cosmic egg, that the universe burst forth from this egg. Um, some interesting facts. So, Auster, the Anglo Saxon goddess, uh, who's often associated with the spring equinox and her namesake. Uh, is the name of the holiday, um, has a little story about eggs as well. So one spring, a little hare in Oster's forest wanted to give the goddess a gift, but the hare didn't know what to give the goddess. So the hare was just going about his little business, looking for a snack, and came across an egg. So what the hare did was decide that, hey, this would be a great gift for the goddess. So what the hare did was he decorated the egg, he colored it, and he gave it to the goddess. And the goddess was so delighted with this little present that the goddess decided that every single spring equinox, all children should get colored eggs. So there you go. Um, eggs, eggs can be used in magic as well. Uh, eggshells, powdered eggshells, are used in root work and they could be scattered around a room, like around the borders of a room, to create a protective and peaceful space. Um, there's another tradition or magic spell that I've heard of often, that at the springtime, before you begin gardening, plant an egg in your garden, and this will actually help create more abundance and fertility and growth in your garden space. So... So there you go, just a little sidetrack on the egg. Um, so let me talk to you a little bit about egg divination. So egg divination is a kind of an interesting thing. It's called umancy, and um, it could be quite messy, and it could be quite unusual. I'm going to give it a try today. I have a pot of boiling water here, and I'm going to see if we can figure out what... Um, <laughs> what egg what the egg is going to divine in the future so there are different ways of using an egg to uh, read the future a very unusual one that I'm not going to try today because it sounds a little bit smelly and gross um, is to prick a little hole a little pinhole in the top of the egg and let the white come out into a glass of water you then leave that glass of water um, <laughs> you leave that glass of water out for about a day and then you go back to the egg and you read the little shapes. So I don't know, that's not my thing. I really just want to cook an egg. That's another option as well. What you can do is crack an egg open and use the egg white and pour it in boiling water and interpret the shape. So apparently what you're supposed to do is just really get your immediate reaction. Maybe it's like an ink blot where you look at it and you go, okay, I see a, you know, I see a heart because love is in the air. So I don't know. Whatever you see, you try and interpret that. So let's give it a try. Oh, I'm sorry. Somebody's here to say hi. Hang on one minute. Hi, Phoebe. <laughs> This is Phoebe. She tends to be in all of my videos. So she's just here. I think she wants to eat some of these eggs that are cooking. Oh, okay. 
All right. <laughs> so I'm going to see, I don't know why I can't read the comments. Hmm. If there are comments, Okay, I didn't finish, did I? Okay, good. I don't know, for some reason I can't pull up the comments. So um, it says that I have comments, but I can't read them for some weird reason. I see that I have reactions. Listen, I am an analog girl in a digital world. I don't know where the comments are, but if I can't read them during this, I promise you I will come back and I will respond to everybody. And if you have questions, leave them. Okay, where was I before Phoebe came over trying to get some egg? Okay, so I'm gonna crack this and um, try and just get the egg white into this bowl. I'm, I'm not really good at this. Okay. Um, I, I know that you could just see my face <laughs> and not really my reaction, but I'm making a total mess. Um, I'm just gonna put that yolk right there and rinse my hands. Live TV, everybody. This is my kitchen. Sometimes, I, you know, it's kind of neat, too, because my kitchen has this, like, nice bar, and I like to pretend that there are people sitting at this bar just, like, watching me do this, and sometimes people come over and they do that. Okay, so I'm going to flip the phone. All right, here's my egg white. Here's my boiling water. Let's see what kind of divination is coming up. All right. <laughs> Phoebe, is this your egg? Is this your egg? Okay, so I'm gonna turn, I'm gonna actually take it off the water. So this is what the egg looks like after you divine it. Do y'all see anything in there? Feel free to leave a comment, even though I have no idea where the comments are. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to take a look at this and I don't know what I see. I don't think that this is the form of divination for me. Maybe y'all would have better luck with this. Hmm. I guess I could say that there's an K in here. K for Kiki. Maybe it's an M. So anyways, this is a form of egg divination. <laughs> That's some good stuff right there. Delicious. Phoebe is still pacing. She's like waiting for her food. <laughs> She's actually like leaning on my leg right now. So anyways, so what have we covered so far? Um, we've covered how to dye eggs. So what you do is, is two cups of water to one cup of product. And that product can be a variety of things. There's a list in my article in the March edition of Which Way Magazine. Um, let's check on our eggs and see how they're doing. See, there's the egg yolk. So this looks amazing. This is the turmeric root, and I'm really just so happy with how fantastic that came out. And here, here's the blueberry. So I think these are about ready. I'm about ready to put in the rest. These look awesome. And here's the beet. One thing I did do to dye the eggs is I, when I took the eggs, um, I'm sorry, when I took the, the, the stuff and I separated it from the liquid and I just had the liquid, I added two tablespoons of white vinegar. I, I don't know. That's what my grandmother used to do. Is that, Okay, so somebody leave one of those comments about why I had to add white vinegar, but it totally did the trick. These look fantastic, and I am going to be eating amazing, delicious egg salad all week. So um, one final thing before we go. We're going to check on this spinach. So here it is cooking. It, you can see the color of the water. Well... You're just seeing steam right now. Here, I pulled back a little bit. The color of the water has gone a little bit green. So I'm going to show you guys how I strained it. I'll put this up here again. Hello. Um, here it is. So I did this. And I'm going to have to 
use both my hands. Um, la, 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 la. Took this, strained it through, and put it into a cup. Tried not to spill everywhere, failed epically. <laughs> Here we go. So here's the green egg dye on the way, hopefully. I've never really worked with spinach before, so I'll let you guys know how they come out. And I'm gonna try one last time to figure out why I can't see comments. <laughs> huh, all right. Well, anyways, I think I've covered everything. I'm gonna try and divine this egg white and see where that goes. Um, I hope that you give it a try, that you try and make some egg dye at home. They came out really beautifully. Um, I'll post a picture when they're all said and done. And again, my name is Kiki and I write for Which Way Magazine. And um, I don't know how to <laughs> read your comments right now, so I'm gonna go back and read them after this is over and answer any questions. So if you need anything, if you have any other questions, please leave a comment and go to whichwaymagazine.com and you can find all of our digital issues, including the March edition, which has a bit of information on egg magic, egg divination, and DIY egg dye. So, <laughs> thank you again. Have a wonderful night. Happy Spring Equinox and Happy Ostara. Bye, y'all. <laughs>
they were given the experience of flying in a hallucinogenic uh, sort of in a manner. Not literally flying, but like sort of in that, in that way. So, um, so that's just the, the quick in a nutshell. Um, there's many books that have been written on the history of flying ointments and entheogenic herbs, especially in European witchcraft tra practices, as well as many um, practices around the world. <clears throat> so, one of the things that I like to do for my own ex uh, spiritual exploration, I, I use these sometimes in rituals within like spirit communication. Uh, channeling and divination to some extent, and also for deep meditation and astral travel, because I have a very active Gemini, a little mildly ADHD brain that, you know, kind of is always going a mile a minute. So sometimes I need to quiet that down. And for me, the products that I make and use all the time really help me connect spiritually to that plane. So Antigens and the, and the psychoactive substances are found within the plant chemicals um, of some of the plants that I meant, which are now also found in, in fungi, uh, natural occurring chemicals, even, you know, some animal byproducts and things like that. Um, and, you know, things like DMT, ayahuasca, cannabis, you know, the list goes on of, of the type of things that kind of fall under that rubric of entheogenic or psychoactive herbs in that sense. And they're often were used um, globally in different cultures for spiritual, sacred spiritual practices and opening, you know, expanding the consciousness and, you know, literally kind of traveling to other worlds. <laughs> so that's just a little bit about that. And it's and just sort of one clarification. It's often Entheogenic and ethnobotanical herbs are often sort of terms that are used interchangeably. Um, so sometimes, like if you're looking online for where to buy some of the, some some of these things, like if you if you're looking up ethnobotanical places that sell ethnobotanical herbs, you're probably going to have you find better results than say places that sell entheogenic herbs. I don't know why. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the type of. Um, Poison path products that I make. Now I do three different kind, like categories, I guess, of flying ointments. So I sort of have, you know, sort of the basic. This one is the Bella Blue one, and this is a belladonna based uh, flying ointment with uh, poppy flowers and blue lotus in it. So I have ones that are sort of just more broad in that spectrum. Um, I do also make ones that are non toxic, and this is the Gates to the Underworld one, which is a non toxic one for doing underworld work. And, and what I do with these is I, I will take a blend that I think this one is I'm trying to remember what I put in it. <laughs> well, I usually use things like blue lotus, clepdaga, wormwood, mugwort, sort of as that the, the non-toxic and, and theogenic base. And then I'll put things that are associated like with underworld workings like yarrow or, or something like that. So and then I did a specialty line for working with specific entities, and I use them broadly, um, whether you want to say gods, goddesses, demons, angels, spirits, whatever. Um, so this is the one I grabbed was I, I did for Lilith. And so what I did with this is I, I built up the entheogenic base. So this one I think has um, Belladonna, uh, a European Mandrake, and Datura in it as its base. And then there's then I add the layer of essential oils, fragrances, and other herbs that are associated with Lilith um, to make the uh, balm for that. And that's, I found that when I was first starting to work with a lot of new entities and stuff, that these really helped ease the, the process into that for some reason. So this was a little on the empty side. But so it's, basically, it's a little bit of like a sort of a balm. So what I do then with this is I'll put a little bit on my wrists and forearms, and I rub it in. So I, I, mean, so I apply sometimes, sometimes I'll just do it once, sometimes I'll, I usually wait like 20 minutes in between, also so it gives it time to absorb or else it'll just be kind of very oily. Um, you know, I put, I put a little bit on my third eye, maybe a little bit, you know, behind the ears, hot chocolate, you know, that sort of thing. 
Um, and then, you know, wait to see how I feel. Now, people always ask, you know, they're like, oh, is this like doing ayahuasca or mushrooms? Am I going to trip balls? I'm like, no, you're not. You're really not. Um, it's more to get your mind in the proper sort of spectrum to do any kind of spiritual work, whether you're doing a ritual, whether you're doing deep meditation, whether you're doing any kind of journey, guided meditation, astral travel, or spirit work, and, and stuff like, or channeling, and things like that. It just, it, it just sort of is an aid to help with that. So, um, that's kind of one of the ways that I use that. So, the flying ointments, um, I use for that a lot. Now, I do have other products. And I do make um, flying oils, and this is a fly agaric mushroom-based one. I do, and these are I do. Um, these are just single ingredient ones. Where like I have a Detura one, I have a Belladonna one. Whereas the flying ointments, I tend to do more layered approach to. Okay, here's sort of you know whatever the base is of you say Belladonna and Detura, and then the things that enhance that and then things that are associated with that and adding kind of the fragrance level to it as well. These are just, you know, the herb or, in this case, mushroom, that is uh, infused in an oil and it's just a loose liquid oil, whereas the other ones are a balm. And it's, similar, and it's a similar action to that. And, you know, you can apply it anywhere and these are in open and these are just in little droppers so just a different a different modality of that and the other two things that i make and i do these in variations is i make tinctures and elixirs and some of these do have toxic elements to them as well i do have a few that have like belladonna in it or mandrake root and things that are perfectly safe you know as long as you know what you're doing i probably wouldn't chug the whole bottle um usually i take like half a dropper full under the tongue um, before I'm doing whatever I'm doing, and that for me usually does the trick. Um, I, there's a couple times, like, uh, this one's called Little Ghost. Um, it's a fly guard, uh, mushroom based one. For me, fly guard makes me very tired the next day, so I, I tend not to do a whole lot. I wouldn't do like three droppers full of that because I would probably sleep for the next 24 hours. But I mean, the worst that would probably happen is it might make you like nauseous or sick, but, um, so I do tinctures, which have a grain alcohol base, and I do elixirs, which have a brandy and honey base. Um, I prefer the elixirs. I'm not a huge fan of grain alcohol, but I do like the, the brandy base ones better. And again, these all have the entheogenic properties. It's just a different modality, depending. And sometimes I do combine them. I'm not going to lie. Sometimes I'll, you know, put this on, and then I'll, you know, take a little dropper full of, of the, an elixir before I'm doing what I'm doing. And I recently released um, about five new um, herbal smoking blends. And again, these all have the anthogenic properties to them. Um, I keep them in little little tins. And you can use uh, rolling papers with them. I prefer, I have a little uh, amethyst um, pipe that I use. I like it because it's just a little, like I can control it a little better because it, it's, yeah, it's not like you're going to, if you're using a rolling paper, you're not going to kind of smoke a full cigarette's worth of it. And then, you know, you're kind of leaving it out already in the paper and stuff like that. So um, I like this because I can just control how much I use, use with it a little better. So that's kind of what I have in terms of my Poison Path products. Now, there are other types out there that other people make. There's like flower essences and things like that. I don't make the flower essences because that's a different process that involves using live plant material, and I live in the city, so I don't really have a lot of space to grow. <laughs> yeah, currently my guest bathroom is my, my poison garden. It's very strange. <laughs> so primarily what I use the all of these different products in varying combinations for is I do a lot of work in the astral realm. So this can be also referred to as astral projection, soul flight, lucid dreaming, out-of-the-body experiences. And this is one of the most common uses for that. And astral travel is a form of deep meditation in which the brain waves slow from the conscious waking state, which is gamma and beta waves, to the in-between 
waking and sleeping sleep states of alpha and beta waves, which the delta waves are mostly associated with deep sleep. So there are numerous ways to invoke astral travel without flying ointments. I often will use guided uh, astral travel or induction meditations or ambient music, things like that, ritual music, to help. That is in a key that helps to lower the brain waves. And I, I, you know, there's thousands of videos on YouTube that vary in length from, you know, 20 minutes to 10 hours. So basically you kind of want to be in a half of sleep state, but still have the mind active enough to explore those inner worlds and travel to different realms. So basically, and I am a very safety conscious person because you kind of have to be when you're working with to- things that are toxic and could literally kill you if you use them Im- improperly. So, you know, when you're, you're working with, especially things in the nightshade family, like Belladonna, Datura, Bramanzia, Headbane, um, European Mandrake Root, um, you know, you don't want to put, put these on mucous membranes, like, you know, with the fly, the, the tinctures and elixirs are meant to be ingested, the flying ointments that also would probably not taste very good. Um, you would want to, um, you know, put it in your mouth or down below. Uh, I get that question quite a lot. Um, just because a lot of it with the essential oils that are in it could be irritants to that, to certain sensitive areas. Um, you know, obviously you don't want to use these if you're pregnant, nursing, or trying to get pregnant. Um, and specifically with the nightshades, you don't want to use them a week prior to having surgery to avoid, um, because all of some of the, some of the chemicals that are in the nightshade family are actually used in surgical anesthesia. So you don't want to like overdose on that. Um, and one of the most common ones, like in Belladonna, like atropine is, uh, if you've ever been to the other doctor and had your eyes dilated, you've had atropine. <laughs> so the one thing you will notice visually when you do like Anything with the nightshades in it, um, you'll notice like that the like the lights seem really bright and colors seem very vivid. It's not a hallucinogenic effect; it's a literal your eyes are dilated from the atropine, basically. Obviously, because these can alter your state of consciousness or make you drowsy, you don't want to be driving or operating heavy machinery. And in certain cases, you know you need to you know use your judgment. You know if you have you know you know, serious medical conditions or allergies, things like that, um, or on particular types of medications. Obviously, keep away from children and pets. Um, You know, there's various side effects that can happen. It's good to know, and I do provide all this information. Like, it's good to know, like, okay, is this normal? Like, the worst thing I've ever had happen if I've done too much of like a flying ointment or something is the next day I've either been really groggy or I've had what's called a dry fever. And a dry fever is just like it's not like a, a flu fever or 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 like a hot flash type thing. It's just like I'm really hot, I can't sweat it out and I'm uncomfortable. I can feel it way for a couple of hours and it passes. So um for me that's the worst I've had that ha- that I've had happen. So um, that's just some general rule of thumb safety things that I recommend, and I always include um, up to date information on how to use all the products, how to, you know what to look out for, what to expect, and I have many. I have a lot of videos on my YouTube channel on different experiences with using them, how I've used them in depth, and I probably have a few hours worth of content on there, um, and my, my uh, YouTube. I have links on my website, belladonnasbotanicals.com, and my YouTube channel is just under my name, Jennifer Vatsa. So please subscribe. <laughs> and um, thank you so much. I just want to give you a little intro to uh, poison path medicine and how it's used within the, witch- the sort of modern witchcraft practices. Thank you so much for watching. And I, uh, I'm looking forward to this event. And uh, uh, I've done a couple of the full moon markets before. Um, This is the first one I'm a presenter for. So uh, thank you so much for watching and take care. Love you all.
Hi everyone, I'm Amy C. Wilson of Otherworldly Waxes here in Beacon, New York. You can find my shop online at otherworldlywaxes.com. You can follow me on Instagram at Otherworldly Waxes, as well as Facebook at Otherworldly Waxes and Twitter at Otherworldly Wax. This evening I wanted to talk about the difference between inspiration, intuition, and imagination. In magic, we rely a lot on our intuition to help guide us to things that we maybe want to manifest in our life, uh, for psychic readings, for all sorts of things intuition is very good for. But sometimes as practitioners of the magical arts or any sort of spiritual path, we find it hard to differentiate what is imagination versus our intuition versus inspiration. So I kind of wanted to help you break it down a little bit and maybe give you some ideas on how to determine which is which. Now, I equate inspiration, a connection to the divine. And I think of it as an artist being inspired to create a painting or a musician to create music or a scientist to come up with an idea to cure some sort of illness. So this being us here, and we're so happy. Inspiration comes down from the divine. And it's part of our purpose here on this planet or earth or three-dimensional plane, whatever terminology you use. And it, it inspires us to go out and achieve goals, uh, to manifest things in our life, um, anything of life purpose oriented. Now, our imagination happens within our mind. Imagination, if you think about it, it's like creative playing with children. Uh, children like to pretend and like to imagine and like to think of wild stories and, you know, really get into that fantasy thing. So imagination is very much based in that. And I'm not saying that our three eyes, inspiration, imagination, intuition, cannot combine. But I'll get to that in a minute. In our intuition, I always like to say it's that gut feeling. Um, like that feeling of maybe something's going to happen, or you're going to get a phone call from a particular person, or something that you think of that actually happens, or has happened, or will happen. So with these three eyes, inspiration, intuition, and imagination, they all live, as I say, on the same cul-de-sac. They intertwine with one another. So this is our little cul-de-sac of happiness, where each resides in their own little house. Now, I know sometimes it can kind of be confusing as a practitioner of the arts um, because imagination and intuition and inspiration can intertwine very easily because they all live on that same little cul-de-sac and they all reside within the mind, within the body, within the spirit. So the way I like to determine uh, what is imagination, what is intuition, and what is inspiration. Um, these little techniques that I particularly use, or references that I use, help me to figure out what, um, what is what. So, for example, inspiration for me may be to, um, comes down through meditation, uh, any sort of trance work. Um, also, sometimes I'll just get that idea, it just pops right in, I'm like, oh yeah, that makes sense. But for me, as a practitioner, I find when I go into some sort of meditation or trance work, intuition comes very, um, ins I'm sorry, inspiration comes 
very quickly to me. So if I'm trying to troubleshoot an issue in my life, such as maybe a work issue or a personal issue, I need to silence my mind and get into some sort of relaxed state. Because when you're in a heightened state, uh, such as anxiety or depression or nervousness or anything that's very mentally consuming, it's hard to connect with our higher power, the source, universe, God, goddess, whatever terminology you use. So it's very important to find a way to silence your mind and connect that way. And typically inspiration, like I said, it's just like this pop, like you see in the cartoons where the little light bulb shines and pops above your head. That's inspiration. And typically inspiration is something that's achievable. So for example, you are looking for employment, maybe inspira divine inspiration will come down and say, hey, did you check this particular website or this, I don't even think people look for jobs in newspapers anymore, or try this or talk to this person. So it'll be inspiration that comes that way, like for an artist or a musician or anybody who has to use um, creativeness, I'm not talking imagination, any sort of created creativeness to solve or resolve a problem, inspiration will come in that way. So for example, um, you need to create something and you don't have maybe a lot of money to do so, divine inspiration will come in and be like, hey, maybe you should check here or maybe you should go here. So it's source connecting with you in that way. Imagination is something that we use to think of different ways to um, connect. It's us, not the divine, and not our gut, which I'll get to in a minute. So imagination would be um, trying to you utilize the knowledge we already have within ourselves to troubleshoot. So for example, Inspiration comes down and be like, hey, we need to build um, a house or a shed for our yard or something along that line. And our imagination will troubleshoot. So we maybe need to get blueprints or go to um, the Home Depot or Lowe's or wherever we go to buy lumber, uh, supplies as nails. It's things like that. Sometimes you can even clump in imagination with intellect a little bit. But imagination is more about you as your individual figuring out how to resolve. Like you think about children's imagina imagination play, the pretend play. Typically children will use their pretend play to resolve issues within their life. Um, you know, that may be going on. So sometimes you'll, you'll see kids like, you know, maybe playing mommy and daddy or, you know, re, you know, playing like, oh, it's me and my teacher or me and my friend or we're doing this and, you know, it's two cars driving or whatever it is to kind of resolve that relationship um, between their personal self and their, and their situations. And it could be, you know, positive things and negative things. It d doesn't always have to be negative. So imagination is like that. So as adults, we use our imagination to troubleshoot and resolve issues such as maybe building the shed for in our yard. So we would have to kind of think and figure out where we would need to go to get those supplies to do so. Now, intuition, which is that gut feeling. Um, intuition, I correlate with um, like everyday practice that becomes a natural thing. So like looking both ways before crossing the street or um, remembering your cloth shopping bags when you go to the store, which I never do. Uh, I always end up having to make 50 trips back to the car. So any sort of like, you know, like um, I need to take the garbage out because it smells. Um, I need to do laundry and you in, 
intuitively know like I need to add detergent, I need to add fabric softener, whatever, you know, these, it's, it's almost feels like a mundane practice. And it just seems like natural and this is how it happens. Uh, just because of, you know, just everyday life, it's like that normal kind of training, that instinctual thing like, oh, I must eat or oh, I must sleep. That's what intuition is like. But it's not so much of the mundane. So for example, um, if you are interacting with another individual, like the intuition that um, they may not be telling the whole truth. So you may feel that in your gut and, and think like, this isn't right. Like they told me they were wearing black pants that day and my gut is saying no, like they're wearing purple pants, like that kind of thing. And it just seems like a natural um, reaction to something like, oh, I'm going to hear from my friend today and they happen to text you or email like around the same time or a little bit into the future. It's just like this knowing like this is just a natural feeling. Uh, like I said, like, you know, the natural process of things of like, just look like that little nudge. Hey, look both ways before you cross the street or, Hey, add the fabric softener to your laundry or, Hey, take the garbage out. It's just natural. Like it feels like it's a normal feeling. Um, but it's more informative than the mundane. So these are how I, this is how I break down the three eyes. But the three eyes can work together. And it's important to understand what is what. Um, because I know some individuals kind of get their wires crossed, or which I do too. Um, or sometimes you are so uh, emotionally attached to the situation that it's hard to differentiate like what is imagination opposed to what is actually intuitive. And it's very difficult um, sometimes to separate ourselves from these things. So typically the process of um, magic or any sort of meditative work or psychic work is that the divine spirit, uh, ancestors, whomever you may work with, will kind of come in and play with your imagination. Now your imagination is like your brain's knowledge warehouse where you have in your in your imagination stored memories, uh, images of objects, particular words, sense, sensations, that sort of thing. So intuition will come down and mix in with that imagination of yours and will give you signs and signals of what it is it's trying to speak to you about. Because a lot of times um, when our, the divine comes in and I'm encompassing ancestors, uh, um, spirit guides and that sort of thing. When that comes in, they can only utilize our mental vocabulary to communicate with us. So that's why a lot of like when people go to get, uh, psychic readings or, um, they're trying to do a magical practice or they're trying to figure out like, what does this mean? It's because your mental vocabulary may be limited. Now I'm not saying like you don't have an expansive mental vo vocabulary, but sometimes what spirit or the divine is trying to communicate with you, it can't seem to find the things. So for example, um, maybe you don't know what the color pink is. So the divine will come down and be like, here's a pink flamingo. And you're like, well, what is, this but it's trying to tell you it's the color pink so it may c continue to show you pink items like a pink heart or um and, and i don't know pink pair of socks and you're like what does this mean and it's the divine trying to communicate with you like look for something pink so it's very important to build our mental vocabulary and the ways that you can do that is reading uh fiction books uh listening to um, music that tells stories, 
um, not so much watching movies or TV, you need to be able to get into your own head and develop these scenarios on your own. Um, uh, more other, other ways that you can develop your <clears throat> mental vocabulary is by uh, exploring, traveling different places, uh, even taking different paths home from work or the store, uh, going out for nature walks. Uh, travel is really great for that. Just experiencing different uh, environments and different individuals and different points of view and different perspectives. Uh, learning, um, even expanding your vocabulary. Um, I know some uh, individuals like to read the dictionary every day and pick out a different word and learn about it. I admire them. I just don't really have the patience for it. And my, I have so many issues with trying to learn new words. Anyway. So our mental vocabulary, our imagination, uh, is very important to develop to order to decipher perhaps what the divine is trying to tell us. So once we have the information from the divine transferring into our imagination, it's our intuition that comes in now to kind of validate what it is that we are trying to achieve, that the divine has asked us to try to achieve in this 3D plane. So intuition may be, um, so for example, we'll go back to building the shed. So the divine is telling us to build a shed. Our imagination is figuring out different ways on how to do it. Like maybe building a blueprint or looking online. Um, what are things that we need? What are good supplies? Like, do we want a tin roof? Do we want a shingled roof? Do we want two doors, one door, that kind of thing. So in intuition, say we go to the store because our imagination is like, oh, go over to Lowe's and, you know, check out what supplies they have. So our intuition may jab us and kind of guide us gently, hopefully gently. I know some uh, in intuitive uh, people don't get gently shuffled <laughs> to where they need to go, but will guide us. So for example, you're standing in front of... Um, a shelf full of nails. So you may look around and your instructions that you came across online may say, use this particular type of nail. So you get the, the type of nail that you need for your blueprint to build your shed, but then you kind of get a nudge, um, hey, maybe I should pick up a box of this na these nails too. So you buy the nails that you need and then the, these extra box of nails that you're not really sure exactly how, like where they're gonna come in. So you get home, you start building your shed, and you have this extra box of random nails. And maybe they're panel board nails that maybe you totally didn't forget, you know, think about. Maybe you wanna put uh, panels inside of your shed, which like a walling inside of your shed, because maybe it'll make it easier to hang your shovels and rakes and you know, leaf blower or whatever you're utilizing your shed for. So these, this is what I'm talking about when I say this is how we work together. Intuition guides us to a place where we can utilize particular tools to achieve particular needs, wants, and, and, and desires. Like, for example, for this shed. Like, maybe we wanted to put paneling up inside, but the, the instructions that we found didn't have that within it. So this is how it all works together. Now, if you are in a space where your emotions are heightened or you're maybe you're just starting to tune into your intuition and divine inspiration and using your imagination, you don't really know how to differentiate it yet. And you're still trying to build those tools within yourself. What I like to tell my students is you can tell if it's your imagination versus your intuition by envisioning that particular thing. And I'm going to use an apple because I like to use apple for this scenario. So I would imagine an apple and it would say it's a nice red lush apple. And in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, this could be a my imagination. This could be my intuition. How do I know? So in my mind, I picture the topic that I am 
feeling that I could be intuitive about. So for example, this red apple. And in my mind, I tried to change the color of the apple. For example, like I might turn it purple in my mind and imagine it purple. Now if that purple color stays on the apple in my imagination or in, I'm sorry, if it stays the color purple in my mind, it is my imagination. If it keeps flipping back to the original red color, it is my intuition. Your intuition will never change. Your imagination can change anything. Your imagination is there to grow and play and just flourish. So it's very important to remember your intuition will never change. Look both ways before crossing the street. It's safe. Imagination will be like, cartwheel across the street or you know fly across the street or jump into the air and like nothing will ever happen so it's more free-flowing and relaxed intuition is more solid grounding and guiding um, and that's how we can differentiate uh, also the differentiation between divine that comes in the divine will also push you the divine and the intuition always work together. It's the imagination that gets us a little mixed up. So the divine and our intuition will always work together. So if the divine feels you're getting off track from building your shed and you end up deciding to build a dog house or a fountain or I don't know, a, a helicopter, whatever, the divine will keep coming back in and nagging your intuition like no you're heading the wrong way you're heading the wrong way you're heading the wrong way you need to be building a shed and not a dog house so your divine and your intuition will always work together your imagination is the thing that kind of like gets um in the mix and kind of guides us a little bit off course on occasion um some people more than others but it can so that is my basic, uh, uh, my basic ideas of how inspiration, imagination, and intuition work together in terms of just everyday life, um, psychic readings, uh, magic, that sort of thing. I hope you enjoyed this presentation, and please follow me on Instagram at Otherworldly Waxes, at on Twitter at Otherworldly Wax and Facebook at Otherworldly Waxes. You can shop um, my shop online at otherworldlywaxes.com. I hold uh, events regularly, so you can find uh, all the events um, and uh, talks that I'll be giving uh, all on my website under events and classes. I hope you enjoyed this, and thank you so much, and I'll hopefully see you all soon. Take care. Bye.